Hi, everybody. Um, thanks Hi. for joining us today. My name is Hannah Baker, and uh, I am one of the co-founders of the Fountain Institute, and we also run the Guild of Working Designers, which is a meetup group that um, meets once a month. Um, we're here to uh, an opportunity to support, commiserate, and activate one another. Um, if you want to find out more about us, you can find us out on uh, meetup.com or on the Fountain Institute website as well. Um, but today, um, you see we have uh, we have the first 15 minutes of a little bit of meet and greet of networking at um, table in the lounge area that will happen again at the end of the talk. Um, but we'll have a talk from Adam Zeiner, who is here with us from Austin, Texas. Um, and he's going to be talking about design makes futures. And um, we'll have a quick Q&A afterwards as well. Um, but yeah, I'm going to quickly introduce Adam. He's a strategic designer based, as I said, in Austin, Texas. He works for um, the Design Institute for Health, which is a radical collaboration between the Dell Medical School and the College of Fine Arts at the University of Texas in Austin. Um, he's also a founding board member of the Design Futures Initiative, and his work is kind of on the avant-garde of emerging sides of design. Um, we at the Fountain Institute have had many conversations with Adam. Um, we always kind of love picking his brain and getting inspiration from him. Um, and so we're really excited to have him today. Um, and I forgot to switch slides for that. But yeah, I'll just let Adam uh, take it over from here. All right. <clears throat> so now I'll, I will present my, not my screen, my, my PDF. Nice. I'll wait for that to load and then I will, I will dive on in. I can see it, so I'm gonna I'm gonna hope others can see it. Um, oh, nice! I like these emoji reactions; they're fun. Cool. I appreciate the introduction. I'm excited to be here. I, I really am a fan of of what what Hannah and Jeff, what y'all are doing at the Found Institute. I'm excited to visit y'all in person at some point in the in the hopefully not too distant future in in Berlin. My name is Adam Zeiner. I'll be talking about how design features. And this is actually Design Makes Futures as part of a larger quote from an academic who is now based in Australia, but was part of um, the design department at Carnegie Mellon in the United States, Cameron Tongwise, who says, what, what designers make, what a lot of us make, become the futures we inhabit. Uh, this makes design unique. Design is a unique discipline in this regard. A lot of other disciplines, a lot of other discourses they talk about or they imagine new things but they don't make those things. Uh, I think what is unique about design is we, we render intangible things tangible. Um, and oftentimes we are doing that at the behest of the, the corporate or nonprofit organizations that we work for. When, when I say futures, um, I, I intentionally, I mean futures, not future uh, for a number of reasons. The, the future is plural. There is not one singular future. Um, but also when I say futures, it, it kind of is, an encapsulation or a moniker for a, a certain way of thinking in, in these uncertain times, um, that it's a, it's a mindset that, that we as designers, we as makers can put into practice through various methods and frameworks that help us and help others uh, contemplate multiple possible futures, multiple scenarios to explore potential circumstances, to explore potential outcomes of the decisions that we make today, and to, to try to inhabit uh, what might happen if, if we if we instantiate what it is that we're, we're coming up with and what we're making. So a little bit of what I'll, I'm gonna do my best to get through this in 30 minutes. I, I didn't, I, I've been working on the slides, but I didn't rehearse it. So I might talk fast at the end, um, but I'll talk a little bit about how I got to where I'm at. What, what, what do I mean by being a strategic designer? Um, what does it mean to design strategically? Um, the, the distinction between us and all design strategic and, and what I mean by it. Um, how I've applied futures to design and how I've seen others do that. Um, some of my vocational, so paid career pursuits and some of my paid personal pursuits that have kind of blended together in this future space. And then some upcoming design futures events that I, that I wanna share with y'all. So, so my career trajectory over the, the course of coming up on a decade toward broader scales, broader frames and broader levels of analysis. Um, I'll kind of situate it in socio-technical systems, and, and I mean this in the organizational development sense. It's thinking about complex organizational design work that recognizes an interconnection between human beings, the social, and, and technical systems or technology, often in workplaces, but also just the, the way that humans and our human society um, interacts, our, how our behavior interacts with the 
complex technical infrastructures that we engage with on a daily basis. When I actually went to, I did my undergrad at the University of Texas at Austin, where I work now. I studied advertising, I studied digital arts, and I studied digital media. Um, and while I was there, as I was wrapping it up, wrapping up my studies, I interned at a startup that Jeff worked at, which is where Jeff and I met. This was back around 2012, 2013, 2012, um, called Mass Relevance. I think then it was called Spreadfast. I think now it's called Koros. Um, after I finished up university studies, I interned at a number of tech startups, working mostly as a product designer, doing some um, very minimal front-end development or front-end prototyping. But a lot of the work that I was doing early on in my career very much focused on the technical side, associate technical systems. I worked at digital agencies. Um, I worked for various startups on the side as well. Um, as, as I progressed in my career, I, I started working in more and more consultative roles. I worked at software design and research consultancies and ACs, and a lot of that work. Let me reshare my. Let me reshare my screen. But I was saying a lot of the work that I was doing at that time was for for larger clients. Like, I failed to failed to publish screen share. Um, I think it'll come back eventually, but um, in that time. A lot of the work that we were doing is while we were designing digital products and services, a lot of it was how do we how do we set up this design capability in an organization that we're we're doing that work for. Um, and then I was going to say now where I'm at now, the Design Institute for Health is very much on the social side um, of that. If, if you were to put socio and social and on a spectrum, I'm very much now more on the social side of those those systems working with. Um, people who live in Travis County and in Austin, Texas, working with our various health systems, working with our various hospital systems and figuring out how do we make the system a little less and a little bit more manageable. Um, I'll wait one more second to see if the, there we go, PDF is back. And that wasn't a bad section for it to cut out at. Um, it'll, it'll catch up with me. This is the this is a good example of socio technical systems. I'm I'm just chatting and I'm trying to be social while the technical part catches up. There we go. Cool. Um, so this should be another. Yep. So what? It, so now in title at the Design Institute, I was hired as an interaction designer, uh, but now I work as a strategic designer, and I'll, I'll touch a little bit on on what I mean by that because um, I know a lot of people have said, well, isn't all design strategic? And, and while that is mostly true, um, some, some applications of design are, I think, more strategic than others. Um, and I'll start with, I really love this simple graphic from Dan Hill, um, who kind of talks about a progression that, I've, that I'm trying to follow in my career. I didn't start out an architect, but um, if you look in the middle, interaction design kind of progressing to service design, thinking more broadly, thinking over longer time horizons, eventually moving towards strategic design. Um, and then on the bottom there, you'll notice speculative design, which is a bit of what I'll touch on today. And I'll, I'll introduce speculative design. Um, it, it is, it is a, a discursive or a very thought-provoking practice. It's based on critical thinking that often questions design as a discipline itself. Um, a lot of the times, the, the work or the output of speculative designers um, it, it challenges what is currently happening, but it challenges us to think about the future, um, to look beyond fiscal quarters, fiscal years, think five to 10 years down the road or more, and think about what could be. What do we want? What do we not want? Um, also, I, I think this, this approach, this approach of speculative design, um, it is inherently multidisciplinary. It's a bit of a meta discipline. Um, and I, I think it also, a lot of times, the design aspect of it helps to render things tangible. It renders visions tangible for people. In, in thinking about what all can be housed under the umbrella of speculative design, and, and I'm going to share this presentation after. I, I made it in Figma, so I'm just going to share it with everyone. But um, Elliot Montgomery, who, who I'm actually fortunate enough to work with now, um, he, he put together this incredible diagram that kind of situates this, this world between unconstrained more your, your unconstrained art-based practices that are meant to be provocative and more constrained strategic business practices. But in this space, there's future studies, design future, speculative design, design, design thinking, design fiction. There's a lot in there. 
Um, and for me personally, how I got to speculative design was uh, when I started out my career as a book designer um, I, and doing interaction design, I was doing a lot of production design work. Throughout the course of my career, I, I do more and more work that is planning focused uh, beyond what is this feature that's going to be built? What what product is this feature a part of? Um, how are people engaged with this product to more? Why does this product exist? Does this product need to exist? What what are we what are we trying to accomplish with this? Um, I, I every every time I talk about strategic design, I recommend this book. I love this book. This book is on my desk. It's it's a very quick read. And I highly recommend it. If you can buy it from Strelka Press, don't buy it from Amazon. Um, and now I'll get back to a. A, a diagram that I think a lot of us are, are familiar with, the design thinking diagram. I know Jeff loves this diagram. Um, thinking about the, the feasibility of something from a technical standpoint, the desirability from a design standpoint, the viability from a business standpoint. If you put all this together, you get magical innovation. Um, I, I kind of wanted to, to, to situate strategic design in that. And design thinking design is one part of how I view strategic design. I think there's also a, a systems aspect to it and a futures aspect to it. I like to think that strategic design kind of lives at the confluence of design as a traditional discipline, um, but applying futures thinking, um, working, being futures literate, but also taking into account um, systems thinking. And, and in doing that, a lot of my work kind of lives in, in this part of that, of that speculative design spectrum. I'm very much more in the design world, probably more on the strategic or constrained side working in industry, but I do get to touch on some design futures work. So applying futures writ large to the practice of design. Again, futures, not future, futures. Uh, here's another diagram that is very popular in the future space. It's called the futures cone. So thinking about the present, if, if all things stayed the same, which would be incredibly boring, um, and I hope they don't because I really visit Berlin, um, the projected future would just be linear. Um, but also let's 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 widen what might happen as we get farther from the present. Like this gives us the the, po the space of possible futures. Within the possible, there's the probable, there's what's probably going to happen in five, 10, 20 years. There is the plausible, what what is is more likely, what is it, what is fathomable? And there is the the preferable. And I think this is where design and speculative design, this is kind of our sweet spot of what do we want to happen? What futures do we want to inhabit versus what futures do we want to avoid? And all that's kind of s situated within like, there's the preposterous, some of what you see in movies, some of the things that like, okay, that, that can't feasibly exist. Let's put that to the side for now. When you're, when you're doing this kind of work, you want to produce something that, that people can inhabit. You want people to be able to suspend their disbelief just enough while still being provocative. Um, another quote from a man named Herbert Simon, he said this in the late 60s, everyone designs who devises courses of action aimed at changing existing situations into preferred ones. Speculative designers, design futurists especially, were focused on the preferred. Another quote, I oh, so then thinking about um, cohering design as a practice and futures as a mindset, design futures I think definitely lives at that nexus, the intersection of design and futures. Um, being a, a craft-driven, making-driven discipline, you make artifacts, you make ap applications, you, you design interactions uh, in order to, to provoke dialogue in a way that people can inhabit. Um, then futures literacy, I kind of touched on. What does it mean to be futures literate? UNESCO has, has a great write-up on this, but I think it's a, mod a necessary modern skill to, to think about um, better futures, understand our role in the future, um, and, and give people tangible ways to think about it because thinking about the future as a human being is very difficult. Um, pros prospection, prospecting, it's really difficult to think about the future. Like do, like right now, think about who, are, who will you be in five years? Who will you be in 10 years? Just that is a really difficult thing to do. So now imagine doing that for an organization full of people, doing that for a city, for a nation state. It's really hard. Uh, but also, it is it is a huge privilege to be able to think about the future, to not be so mired down and concerned and stressed out in the present that you're able to think about the future. Another quote um, from author William Gibson, the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. I think 
during this global pandemic that we're still living through, that is more than, than ever. Um, but to to expand on that, um, Dr. Demeji Onafuo, he he spoke in an event of ours last year, um, and I love that he he spoke to how a lot of the futures that we'll envision in the, in the Western hemisphere and the Northern world, those are already being inhabited experiences by those in the global South. A lot of the repercussions of our ancestors' actions and our near term, like our parents, our grandparents, those are being acutely felt by people living in the global South right now. Um, also, I think futures, applying a futures mindset to design, it, it helps us move beyond short-termism. Uh, if, if you work in an organization, which I'm gonna assume most of you who work, work in some kind of organization, um, oftentimes you're constrained to thinking in fiscal quarters or at least cycles, maybe thinking uh, longer term for, for roadmaps in fiscal years, a one, three, five year plan. Um, there isn't a lot of opportunity or space to think beyond that. And I think that's really necessary. I also think um, oftentimes design, um, a lot, of, a lot of the times what we would do is, was kind of prescriptive. Our remit was, here's this brief, here's this problem, you solve this. Not as designers saying, here's the problem space. We come up, we help identify the problems that are going to be solved. I think um, approaching projects with a futures mindset can really help you move into more of the, the upstream to strategic mindset of like, okay, that's all well and good, but really this is what we need to focus on. Um, images of the future, in whatever form that may come, whether it's a vision statement, whether it's narrative, whether it's a, a scenario, whether it's a, a forecast, whether it's really, really inspiring and heartening or whether it's terrifying, it can really impact how we plan now. So applying futures. Futures, um, as I'd mentioned, uh, stories, experiences, artifacts, um, things that, that can be used as boundary objects to help groups of people analyze a situation, analyze potential future situations, plan from the present, and build consensus around ways they want to move forward and ways they don't want to move forward. Um, also, conceptual strategies that you can use to think about. You can you can use them in the near term, in your fiscal years, in your fiscal quarters, thinking about release cycles, thinking about how that builds up to, to longer term um, midterm futures, your five, 10 years from now, or even longer term, 20, 50 years from now, which is a lot harder, but isn't impossible. Um, a lot of the, the methods that are applied by people who work in this space come from two academic, largely academic disciplines, one being future studies. Um, this is uh, the, the futurists, entire futurists I've worked with have PhDs in this. Um, and then also the applied discipline of strategic foresight thinking why the future might be different from today. Um, oftentimes this is in a more strategic space. So you 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 will hear trend forecasts, you will hear insights reports, innovation teams. That's more the strategic foresight world. Uh, and I got the opportunity to work with trained futurists through work um, on a project over the course of a couple of years. And I started knowing noticing a huge connection between how they approach things and their methods and how I approach things as a designer. A lot of times it starts with research. Um, their research looks a little bit farther, farther back at historical trends and it looks broadly at um, technical innovations, value shifts from a, the cultural standpoint. What are some of the geopolitical goings on? What are some environmental factors at play in the past and presently? What are past and present economic developments that need to be considered? What are demographic patterns? Um, demographic being like um, climate refugees, the fact that sea level rising, they, they think about a lot of that. As, as they're doing the research, then there's synthesis. As designers, you do research, you synthesize what you learned um, from the data that they have generated. They, they start to cohere that and they, they look for patterns. They start to think about how can we situate what we've learned in potential future scenarios. A lot of times this helps with your planning. And then oftentimes you, you do research, you, you synthesize what you learned, you plan, you strategize, you figure out how are we gonna move forward? What, what are we, oftentimes, what are we gonna make? Um, but also, as designers, just like futurists, we can work as facilitators. We can help communities. We can help corporate organizations. We can help people think about what is their preferred future. We can help them compare and contrast potential futures. Um, we can also do this and, and create design artifacts in service of practical present-day planning and policymaking. 
Uh, and then this is a space that is really fun to play in. And Jake Dunnigan is going to speak um, at a meetup I'm organizing next week. But experiential futures, this stuff, this gets really fun. Um, designing skits, designing installations, creating real world things that it could be in virtual reality as well. It could be um, augmented reality in browser, but it, designing tangible scenarios that people can inhabit to get them to think about these features. Also, one thing I want to touch on too that I won't touch on too much today, but I think is very, very important. Um, over the course of working on projects with Futurists, I notice how inherently systemic their work is. They're, they're thinking systemically in the present and they're thinking systemic, systemically about the past and about the future. Um, as I said, I made this in Figma. So I, I made, when I was working with them, I made a little mind map trying to connect some dots between futures, design and systems and who are some players that I'd heard about through the course of the project. I made it on Kumu. I have a link to that that I'll share with you all. Um, I think it's really important to think systemically if you're thinking about the future. I think it's really important to think systemically if you're thinking about the present, um, but also you might not always be able to do that. And so I'll talk a little bit about how I've gotten to work in this space. Um, some of my my avocational pursuits, some of the things I've done because I, I love it and want to do it, even if I'm not getting paid for it. Um, I first learned about this world of futures uh, through someone who I was in an art collective with. Um, Back as I was wrapping up college, I did a digital arts and media program. I loved making interactive installations. I loved doing it with friends, especially engineers, so I didn't have to do the engineering. Uh, one of my friends, Kevin Riley, he just based on conversations with him, he was like, have you ever heard of design fiction? I think you'd really like this. He gave me this book called Hertzian and Tales from Anthony Dunn. It's basically this, it's basically Anthony Dunn's thesis in book format. It's really dense. It is really, really dense. I didn't get through it all. Um, but it just opened up my eyes to this whole new world. Um, I, a great book from Anthony Dunn and his partner Fiona Raby is Speculative Everything. If you want a light introduction to this world of speculative design, this book is an incredible introduction. Uh, they also, uh, Dunn and Raby, for, for the most part in, in a modern setting, they kind of coined the term speculative design. Um, they're they're involved with, with this discipline to varying degrees nowadays, but I, I think they very much coined, kind of coined, this, coined the term. Um, after, after learning about this world of, of speculative design, speculative futures, design fiction, I got lucky that uh, there's a meetup called Speculative Futures, and this is back in 2016. Time's blurry now, I mean, especially after the past year, but back in 2016, there was a Speculative Futures meetup in Austin and Jake Dunnigan was speaking at it. And the topic, I was just like, wow, like this is it. Like this is so fascinating. I went to that meetup, I was like, yep, this is it. This stuff is incredible. Um, I was fortunate that I was actually um, able to, to take over the Austin chapter. Um, speculative Futures as a meetup title, especially in Austin where startups are a big thing, is a little weird because sometimes people will think it's finance focused, right? Um, futures. Thinking, thinking about stonks, stocks, bonds, that kind of stuff, but also speculating about the markets. But really, speculative futures is meant to focus on speculative and critical design, design methods that can address these huge societal wicked problems that are futures focused, and then futures, future studies and strategic foresight, like, like I mentioned, but also design being an applied discipline. How can we apply their methods and that mindset to the design work that we're doing? As I mentioned, uh, I, I organized the Austin chapter of the Speculative Futures Meetup. I've been doing that for three or four years now. Um, I'm fortunate to have two co-organizers, Ileana Martinez and Mirandi Kim. We're doing an event next week that I'll tell you all about. Um, and also, as, as the Speculative Futures community grew, what was six meetups in 2016, I think we're close to 60 meetups now on six continents. That's a lot. Uh, so. So Phil, who started it, I invited myself and three other people to join the founding board of directors for the Design Futures Initiative, uh, which is now the nonprofit behind this meetup community, as well as the um, primer speculative design and strategic foresight conferences, as well as a design futures training I'm going to mention here in a bit too. So then I also, I, I'm fortunate that I get paid to do some of this work. I'm, I'm very glad that I get paid to do some of this work. Um, I work at the Design Institute for Health. 
Um, I was going to switch over to the website, um, but since I'm presenting my PDF, I won't just, I'll just speak to a little bit of what I do. Um, I got really, really lucky um, that when I joined the Design Institute as an interaction designer, it just so happened that they were kicking off a project called Foresight. I mean, this is this super serendipitous and I got really lucky. I think any other interaction di designer would have gone crazy on this project for two years, but I, I got to engage in this years long philanthropic initiative called Foresight um, as an interaction designer to help stand up a web platform called What If Health to, to help people step into alternative future scenarios about health in the United States. Um, we, we wrapped up this website in October of last year for the Foresight National Convening. And if you're interested in checking it out, um, it's at, at whatifhealth.org. Um, but over the course of two years, I got to do interaction design work, but then I also got to act as the, the kind of resident design futurist at the Design Institute, translating some of what the, the PhD futurists on this project were doing. And I was able to take their work and I was able to represent it in a, in a more accessible, engaging, interactive manner on the web. Um, so I'm really lucky that I got to do that. Um, after working on, on, or while working on this project, uh, I was fortunate that I got accepted into the speculative edu summer school program in 2019 in Rome. So I, I got to go to Rome for five days uh, to be part of this Neo Rural Futures uh, project. It was throughout the course of five days, five teams, there were five of us, we were focused on different regions and we, we came up with, with speculative artifacts. Um, our group, since, since a few of us were a little bit more familiar with the speculative work, we opted to, to create a scenario, um, but some of the other groups, this, the, the exhibition was, was four artifacts or four scenarios. Um, speculative edu is, is based in, in Europe. Um, if you aren't familiar with it, definitely check it out. They're, they're producing some incredible content. Um, they interviewed Phil, who founded the Design Institute. I loved the summer school. Going to Rose awesome, but also I just, I love the people that I got to meet. I think it's a great network that they're building. Um, if they ever decide to make their way over to the US, I'll, I'll definitely hopefully work with them. Uh, and then also, we're more and more at the Design Institute. We're doing futures workshops for, for our clients. Uh, this is a graphic notation from a summit that we hosted at the end of last year, thinking about um, the future when, when mental health or mental illness is decriminalized. Um, and I love this graphic because I think the, the, the author of it, um, or the, the woman who, who drew it, did a great job of representing how we moved attendees through design towards towards futures and you'll you'll kind of notice that futures come right like moving through some of like a design mindset into a futures mindset to let people really think about what could a radically different future where in the united states we don't use the criminal justice system to deal with mental illness what could that look like um and i had to throw this in just because I, I think jeff will get a kick out of this the double diamond i'm sure you've all seen the double diamond in a million different forms um as i think about kind of coherent cohering or thinking through um doing like a really foundational systems uh, and like a systemic analysis to kick off a project to inform some of the more traditional design work that you do as you're as you are diverging and converging in sense making and then taking that and then thinking about um from a future standpoint what where could that go um, i just i wanted i also just wanted to throw in the, the double diamond and the, and the diagram um so also i think i've got 30 seconds left so i'm i'm proud of myself i'm doing good on time um three upcoming events that i wanted to tell you all about this weekend, and I think Joseph, who's in the audience, will be attending um, the Design Futures Initiative in partnership with Kedge's The Future School. We're doing our first Futures by Design training. Um, it's going to be a long weekend for me. We're, we're doing two, two days of, of training where you move through, through um, our Futures by Design framework. Um, you, you move through different mindsets, utilizing different futures methods in the process. Um, Next, next week, my, my, the Austin chapter of the Speculative Futures Meetup, uh, we're doing an event on design futures. And again, 
happy, a happy coincidence that I'm speaking about this now and I can tell you all about it. it it'll be at 7 p.m. Austin time, which is like 1 a.m. for Central Europe. But um, Jake Dunnigan and Tammy Glass from UT are gonna be speaking about how they teach design for futures. Jose De La O from Mexico City is gonna be talking about how he teaches critical design. Kelly Cornett, who's based in Toronto, will be talking about how she teaches futures with her design background. And then Jack and Anna from the Design Futures Institute will be talking about the Design Futures training. And then in June, uh, I, I really wanna expand more on the similarities I see between futures and systems, whether it's futures literacy, thinking future, in the, thinking with a, with a mindset or thinking systemically, I think the two are, are inextricably linked. Um, and I'm gonna be organizing an event with my co-organizers, Ileana and Mirandi on that. That's it, I'm done. I don't know how to end the presentation. I think I'm gonna stop. Hey, yeah, you got it. <laughs> 30 Thanks. minutes. Yeah, you were like on the dot. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, that was, it was so great hearing all that. I mean, um, as I mentioned earlier to everyone, we've, we've had personal conversations, um, a couple of weeks ago, we actually had a, a conversation that's just got put out as a podcast yesterday, which is, goes into some more of these side tangential conversations, uh, that you went into today. So if you want to like talk further about that, you can check it out as well. Um, but yeah, I just feel like it, it. things kind of clicked or clarified for me in a different way today through your presentation. Um, and I think that that was, for me, it was really, it was really great to kind of see this um, path and, and and actions that you were making through everything. So um, yeah, I, I forgot to mention a little bit or one thing before you started, um, there is the chat, or sorry, the question function on the left-hand side of the panel. Um, we're gonna be going through a little bit of Q and A right now. Um, so there are some questions in there already, but if anyone had any questions they wanted answered, please feel free to uh, put them in the chat. You can also upvote questions um, that you're interested in, in hearing about. Um, but yeah, I'll just get started. So we have a question uh, question from Jesse. Um, he's saying, how can future design or strategic design be applied to organizations like Stratfor, based in Austin, or the European Council on Foreign Relations, or other institutions that directly advise govern, uh, governments or corpor or, and corporations? Sure. It's one, a, a really recent example on Twitter, Stuart Candy talked about some work that he did with the UN, I think it's the UN's Keeping Affairs Division, but he, he talked about a, an experiential or design fiction exercise he did with, with delegates there where he, he interviewed them. And from that interview, he came up with an artifact that he gave them. So when they all convened, they were able to use those artifacts to, to to bound conversations on certain possible futures. Um, a more, more near term than that, and on a, on a more granular organizational scale, a lot of it, a lot of it comes down to planning. It comes down to figuring out what is it that your organization is driving towards, um, using that to inform or think through the implications of that, um, and also using that using. Well, not using, but approaching planning sessions that are really like presently focused, um, bringing bringing in some examples or tangible ways to let people think longer term, so that they that they're able to move beyond just like okay, here's what we got to do in sequential order. Mm. Yeah, and and you've mentioned you mentioned this sometimes in your talk, and I remember you talking about this um, on the uh, in our conversation before, and like you're talking about bounded. Um, objects, is that what you call them, or bounded ideas? And um, and then artifacts, like you kind of had, I was wondering if you could clarify or talk about those two terms a little bit, because um, you're kind of t referencing that with like, there's this like tangible thing, or there's like something like bounding something mean in, in, in this idea of like objects or, or, or uh, artifacts, yeah. Sure. Yeah, so boundary, like a boundary, boundary object or a boundary artifact. It's a term I, I learned from uh, someone who came from the Stamps Design School at the University of Michigan. Essentially, it's it's it could be a a visual diagram. It could be an a literal physical object that helps everyone look at one tangible thing, and that's what bounds a conversation. Um, 
a lot of times in the work I do, we we do a lot of journey mapping. We do a lot of system mapping. And those maps, it's even like the draft versions of them can be used as boundary objects to just get everyone looking at the same page or, mm -hmm. or talking about the same thing. And then in terms of bounding a problem, um, there's a saying in the US of don't boil the ocean. Don't try and focus on everything at once. Really think about what, what can you focus on. And I think designers can be a big part of, of bounding a problem space or saying, this is the context that we're going to work in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I think, I mean, it's interesting to hear your definition of that because it's like the concept was like clear to me, but it was always kind of like, it's interesting in, in the connection to like what it's utilized for, or like the action that happens from bounding something to, um, we have a question from, uh, Chang and he asks like, can you, uh, please give us an example of speculative design and maybe could you like give us an example of like one of your, something that like excited you or favorite, one of your favorites or something like that, like a high, a top, uh, highlight for you. <laughs> Sure. So I'm, I'm going to use I'm going to use the example that I that I used when I talked about when I talked with y'all a couple of weeks back because I think it's hilarious. For those who don't know, in the U.S., we love we love quick, cheap food. We love we love chain restaurants. There's a chain that I actually love called Chill. Um, and in Austin, Texas, um, in the in East Austin, in Texas, it is an area that has been rapidly gentrified the, in the course of a decade the neighborhoods have, have changed drastically. Um, so an artifact, like an example of speculative design that I think is, is hilarious is, I don't know who did this. I wish I knew who, if, if whoever did this project is watching or someone knows them, please have them reach out to me. Um, a group put up a bear on an abandoned building in East Austin that said, East Side Chili's coming soon. So basically in this like hip gentrified neighborhood that was a lot, they were gonna put this big, boring, boring, chain restaurant. Um, and as part of that banner, they came up with a menu of all these East Austin focused dishes and people got pissed. A lot, and a lot of these people were people who had recently moved to Austin. A lot of these people were people who were actively gentrifying East Austin. They got pissed and they're like, what? I can't believe the cheese is coming here. That's bullshit. And that, those, those objects, that, that banner and that menu sparked so many conversations. Uh, to the point where Chili's had to get on Twitter and be like, hey, this isn't us. Like, we're, we're not doing this. Um, I think a hilarious example. And then another example, um, something that might be a little bit more fantastical. Um, uh, I'll, I'll have to, if it pops into my head, I'll, I'll, I'll say it. Okay. Um. We have uh, another question here. Um, so uh, what, like, do you ever look into the past, maybe with research to understand possible futures? You kind of touch about this, but um, maybe you could talk a little bit about your own experience with doing that as well, as like in the design, like as a designer specifically. Sure. I mean, as a designer specifically, um, whenever I would work with different organizations, I would, I would, I would want to look at their old work. I, I would want some kind of historical context on what am I stepping into. Um, sometimes that's just what work has already been done, what research has already been done, uh, digging into like why the organization functions like it functions. Um, when I was working on the Foresight Project with, with Futurists, um, they had people on their team who were actively looking um, largely online at, at past historical trends. Uh, and they, they were, they had broad categories that they were researching in, um, like as broad as um, pharmacy, like that's like how broad. Um, but yes, it was very much looking at what are some significant historical trends or social trends or demographic trends that led to where we're at. That kind of what, why are we, why are we where we are? Um, and as a designer whether it's in an organizational context, it's okay, why does this organization exist? Why does it exist in a different form? Why is it building what it's building? Like why did Twitter come, in, come into being, right? Um, so you, you very much, I would highly recommend, yeah, looking at, and again, don't boil the ocean, like don't go too far into the past. Like you can geek out and be like, oh, videos exist because zoetropes exist because people drew on cave walls. Like you don't need to go that far, but like some sense of why does this, 
organization you're a part of exist? Why does this product that you're laboring to help to de like deliver to humans, like why does it exist? Yeah. Um, we have, we only have a couple more minutes because I know um, Adam can only stay with us for a little bit longer and I want to give some time to you to pop into the rooms and chat with people uh, um, as well. But I'm just going to finish up with uh, two more questions. One is from uh, Anya and she's wondering, do you know or are there any initiatives on how to involve teenagers with these topics? Um, it's so interesting and it would really, uh, it would, uh, would really be interesting to see how to involve younger uh, people in these frameworks and such. Um, yeah, so do I, I if you go to futures.design, futures.design, that's the Design Futures Initiative website. We have two programs that are working directly with children. Um, one is figuring out how do we take these shops um, and and deliver them to elementary, like young children, um, kids who are nine, 10, 11, 12 years old. So we do have youth programming that that some of the chapters will do. Um, and was it at, like asking for specific initiatives that do this? Um, I think the I want to say that the, the speculative futures chapters doing the youth programming are working with Boys and Girls Club. I could be wrong, um, but another project we're figure, trying to figure out is is a, a virtual reality learning game to help people help children think about the future. Um, and again, if I if I think of other examples, I'll I'll just send them to y'all. Um, but yeah. you could look up. I would just look up futures literacy. Uh, youth programming, I think, would be a good way to, to to find more initiatives like that. Yeah, sometimes you just need to know the right word to put into Google. <laughs> like, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, I'm just going to end it here um, for the conversation side of this. Um, and again, like, thank you so much. Um, uh, also, I just wanted to mention, we, we talked about before, if you want to find out more about Adam and the work he's doing, you can also check out his website, which is design.co, D-E-Z-I-N. Am I saying that? Is that right? D-E-Z-E-I-N.co or dot .info. Yeah, I yeah. got lucky. Designer, designer, it kind of design, it works. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he'll be able to, as I said, stick around for maybe like 10 10, 15 more minutes. And so he'll be on some of the tables if you want to like continue on some of these conversations. Um, I also just wanted to mention that our meetup next month that we have designer D scenario with us. She's a Berlin based um, designer who's an innovation coach. She facilitates workshops um, and she'll be joining us uh, talking about transitions into freelance and how do you design your own career path, um, something along those lines. Um, so I hope that you guys can join us for that. Um, and if you're curious about these meetups or other workshops or um, information that we're doing with the Fountain Institute or the Guild of Working Designers, you can join our newsletter. It's Beyond Aesthetics. Um, we share every Wednesday morning um, industry insights, resources, and we'll keep you up to date with the different events that we have. Um, you can check out the link um, to sign up for the newsletter there. But other than that, thank you guys so much.